Plenty of evidence has come to light over the years for the geological origin of Stonehenge's bluestones. It's widely accepted that they came from a part of Wales almost 200 miles away. However, how this process took place is still debatable. Most archaeologists think it was a result of human action. In fact, there's a lot of support for the hypothesis that the blue stones were quarried from the Priscelli Mountains and then erected as a stone circle nearby before being dismantled and intentionally moved to where Stonehenge stands today. These quarries have even been identified. Some researchers think that water played a role in this difficult endeavour, others that the stones were moved entirely over land. The possibility that the bluestones were transported by natural processes, such as via glacier ice, has also been researched and discussed but often dismissed. Now, geomorphologist Brian Stephen John has published a paper in the ENG Quaternary Science Journal arguing that the bluestones were, in fact, glacial erratics. As I've discussed in previous videos, Stonehenge was erected in several phases during the Neolithic and the Bronze Age. The monoliths that make up the horseshoe in the centre, the outer circle and several other features are sarsen stones which originated from a quarry close to Stonehenge. The other 43 stones are referred to as blue stones. However, from a geological perspective, this term has no meaning because their geochemistry is pretty varied. Over the years, the multiple sources of these 43 blue stones, as well as many other fragments found in and around Stonehenge, have been identified in West Wales. However, no exact provenances for the 46 different lithologies present in the bluestone assemblage have been determined with any certainty. As is discussed in the paper, since there is a lack of lithological conformity, several researchers in the past have suggested that the bluestones are actually degraded glacial deposits. Having originated at various locations in West Wales before reaching Salisbury Plain via glacier ice, where they were then sourced for construction. In 2018, the author of this current paper, Brian Stephen John, made several observations about Stonehenge. He noticed that the bluestone monoliths looked like highly weathered erratic boulders that had been collected within the local landscape rather than carefully selected blocks extracted from a quarry. He also noticed that both the sarsens and bluestones were continuously reworked without ever being finished. In his opinion, and that of E. Herbert Stone writing in 1924, the monument was abandoned, unfinished, when the supply of stones ran out. There have been several arguments against a glacial origin for the blue stones. One researcher in 1923 believed they had found a geological match for some of the sampled blue stones in the Fishguard Volcanic Group outcrops in the Priscelli Hills of West Wales. Such a limited geographic origin for their particular geology would rule out the possibility of them having been carried by glacier ice. Two Neolithic stone quarries have also been identified over the years in the Fishguard Volcanic Group. Although, as John points out, the quarries may explain where some foliated rhyolite and spotted dolerite monoliths came from, but they do not explain the entire bluestone assemblage. Another argument is that glacier ice is thought not to have extended further south than the South Pembrokeshire coast. However, it's been determined over the last century that the Irish Sea ice stream during the Anglian glacial episode around 450,000 years ago did reach the Somerset, Devon and Cornwall coasts at least once. So it's not impossible for the Blue Stones to have reached Stonehenge by way of glacial transport. That said, several experts argue that the lack of a Blue Stone erratic train between North Pembrokeshire and the Salisbury Plain proves the blue stones could not have been carried by glacial ice. An erratic train is formed when boulders are picked up from an entrainment area carried by glacial ice and deposited along the way. They also argue that there are no blue stone erratic boulders or other glacial deposits on the Wiltshire Chalk Downs. Other research on the River Avon's terrace gravels in the Salisbury area show that out of 50,000 pebbles studied, there was not one that could not have come from local bedrock. In light of these arguments, John suggests that any stones of foreign origin on the Salisbury Plain 
ought to be studied in detail, and there are thousands. They are largely referred to as debitage, meaning they were fragments that fell to the ground when Stonehenge's monoliths were being shaped or when stone axes were being manufactured. However, not all appear to be debitage. In fact, large clasts with weathered edges have also been discovered. Unfortunately, many have also disappeared because in the early 20th century, they were not viewed as important to the study of Stonehenge. During excavations at the monument in 1924, four clasts were found in the southeast quadrant of the monument, three made of rhyolite and one made of diorite. One of these is now called the Newell Boulder and measures 22 by 15 by 10 centimeters. It's a rhyolitic boulder of welded tuff or ignimbrite. Having been stored privately for 46 years, it was studied in 1970 before being stored at Salisbury Museum. In 2022, it was studied again by John. I won't discuss the lithology of the boulder and every detail of any damage, fracturing or scars on its surface, since this is a highly specialist subject and won't mean much to those of us that are not earth scientists. I'm more interested in the conclusions that John draws from his study and a reanalysis of the previous work on the new old boulder. Firstly, with regards to its origin, it's quite different to the Stonehenge bluestones, but does have similar characteristics to the rhyolitic lavas and welded tufts in the Fishguard volcanic group. However, John hesitates to allocate it an exact provenance, such as a specific quarry, which other researchers have done. There are numerous reasons outlined in the paper why it's difficult to give it such a specific origin. In this section, John also points out that the exposed rhyolite at one quarry in the Priscelli Hills was so fractured and brittle that Neolithic and Bronze Age groups never used it for building megalithic monuments in West Wales. This raises the question, why would they quarry such blocks and transport them all the way to Salisbury Plain? Secondly, based on its surface characteristics, John concludes, and most of his colleagues agree, that the Newell boulder is not a piece of rockfall debris or a fluvial transported or wave-washed clast. It achieved its characteristics via subglacial transportation. Much damage has been done to the boulder since its excavation, but there's also evidence it was worked prior to that. Some experts, including John, think the builders of Stonehenge tried to shape the boulder into a tool, but abandoned it because the stone was inferior. This is another argument against human agency having been involved in the transportation of the blocks from West Wales to the Salisbury Plain. Because why would people have moved boulders over such a long distance that were of too poor a quality to be used for building monuments or making tools? John writes a useful summary at this point. In his opinion, the boulder was transported on the bed of a glacier before being emplaced on or close to the Salisbury Plain. The top of the boulder was above ground for a long time and became weathered as a result of this. Due to it being in a calcium-rich environment, a crust of tufa formed on the buried parts of the boulder. A prehistoric axe maker attempted to shape the boulder, but ended up giving up. It was then thrown away with chalk rubble during the construction of the Neolithic part of Stonehenge. Eventually, it became buried at a depth of 64 centimetres and more tufa formed around it, including on the surfaces that had been worked by the axe maker. It was then discovered and excavated in 1924. So if the new old boulder was a glacial erratic, it opens up the possibility that the other bluestones were as well. However, as pointed out earlier, there are several arguments against this. Towards the end of the paper, John discusses evidence for glaciation on the Salisbury Plain. He points out that contrary to popular belief, no consensus actually exists on the subject of how the bluestones reached Stonehenge. In actual fact, within the earth sciences field, there is a preference for the glacial transport hypothesis. One of the arguments against this hypothesis that I mentioned earlier in the video is that no erratic boulders have been found on the Chalk Downs and Salisbury Plain. But John mentions that there is an abundance of literature proving the opposite. Erratic clasts have indeed been found there. No coherent glacial deposits such as depositional landforms have been found, but the area has not been thoroughly investigated.
Another argument against the hypothesis that I mentioned is that there's no erratic train between Pembrokeshire and Salisbury Plain. However, much of this would have been submerged under the Bristol Channel or covered by the organic sediments of the Somerset levels. Another study which argued against the hypothesis analysed 50,000 pebbles in the River Avon gravel terraces and found that they could all have come from local bedrock. These flint and green sand pebbles may indeed have come from local bedrock, but it's just as possible that they were glacially transported from upper green sand outcrops to the west as well. 20 other bluestones have been documented by the Wessex Archaeological Trust as having been found in the environs of Stonehenge. They are usually explained as being fragments of destroyed bluestones from Stonehenge that have ended up in other contexts. Some of these include a rhyolite cobble found near Durrington, bluestone clasts found in the Amesbury 39 Long Barrow, and several clasts on the summit of Silbury Hill. The destroyed Stonehenge bluestone hypothesis doesn't explain why some of these clasts have been found in contexts that predate Stonehenge. Although this study is on the Newell boulder specifically, the bluestones at Stonehenge do also have the appearance of erratics. John gives a number of complex reasons why glacial sediment sequences and depositional landforms might not exist on Salisbury Plain, even if the ice had reached that far at some point. He doesn't think that this particular glaciation was a part of the last glacial maximum around 20,000 years ago, but thinks that it occurred as part of the Irish Sea Ice Stream during the Anglian Glacial episode around 450,000 years ago. I had no idea that there was such a difference of opinion between archaeologists and earth scientists regarding the origin of the bluestones. It's also interesting that the bluestone assemblage represents 46 different lithologies and that it's unlikely they all came from the two Neolithic quarries in West Wales, so often mentioned in the literature. It's a pretty big difference of opinion because one side says a prehistoric community transported huge blocks almost 200 miles, and the other says they sourced these stones locally. That's not to say Stonehenge wasn't a huge achievement anyway, but the first hypothesis also requires us to understand how that transportation took place, and no one's ever quite pinned that down. I did a video video recently about the altar stone at Stonehenge, which is now thought may have come from Cumbria or Orkney. Could glacial processes have also been involved with that? I don't know, but it's definitely worth looking into. This geomorphologist has a blog, so I'm going to have a read of his articles and see what I can find. That's it. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, hit the like button. A big thank you goes out to my patrons and channel members, and I'll see you next time.